Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. A prophecy, a promise, and a prayer. That's what Jesus gives us today, that we would be ready when he returns. And really, the, the season of Advent that we're in is all about being ready. The word Advent, of course, means coming. And so here we are preparing to celebrate Jesus' first coming at Christmas. But Advent is not just the pre-Christmas season. Advent is also a time when the church lifts our eyes and remembers that Jesus will come again, the prophecy that he will return, and which has not yet been fulfilled. And so that we might be ready, he gives us these three today, a prophecy, a promise, and a prayer. When we talk about the end of the world, it seems to me that, that we tend to think about things like wars and famines and earthquakes and other bad things. And certainly Jesus said, these will happen. But when we see these signs, Jesus said, don't, don't be alarmed. The end is still yet to come. So we shouldn't, when we see the headline on the evening news, we shouldn't immediately draw the conclusion, Jesus is, is coming uh, right now, but rather we should be reminded he is coming and that we are to be ready. But Jesus does give us a prophecy this morning, a set of unmistakable signs that will come right before his return. He said the signs will be unmistakable seen in the heavenly bodies, the sun and the moon and the stars, that these things which seem so solid will suddenly be shaken. And we lived in California for six years and we never experienced an earthquake ourselves, but we talked to plenty of people who had. And it seemed like they always explained it or described it in the same way, using the same word. They said that an earthquake, if you live through one, it is eerie. It's an eerie feeling because the ground is supposed to be the most solid thing there is. And suddenly the ground is shaking. If you're somewhere and there's an earthquake, you will notice it. And Jesus says that when these things happen, when these things are shaken, you will notice it. And we should know at that moment that Jesus' return is imminent. This is the prophecy. And to consider what he's talking about. The, the sun and the moon and the stars that move in such predictable patterns that people are able to say with exactness when an eclipse will be or where the stars will be at any given moment of the year or what the cycles of the moon will look like far in advance. Just imagine, just imagine one little hiccup, one little misbehavior in a star would cause a, a ripple effect in the scientific community. People wouldn't know what to do with it. Imagine when all of it is shaken. And you can see then why Jesus includes in his prophecy how people will respond when they begin to see these things. And he uses words like perplexity and distress and fainting in fear. But then he has this to say to, to believers. When these things begin to happen, he says, now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. The prophecy is clear that when these things happen and nature itself is shaken, we should know that Jesus is coming and coming very soon, that soon we will see him in his power and in his glory. The kingdom of God is near. This is the prophecy. And now on to the promise. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, if we think that we are standing on solid ground when our feet are planted on this earth, we have to think again, because this earth itself will be shaken and will be removed. No, we have to take our stand on something more solid than the earth itself. And so Jesus gives us this promise. He promises that in his words, we have something that will remain even when the earth itself melts away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Just let that sink in for a moment. 
That is the, the central claim of Christianity, that what Jesus said is true, as remarkable as it is, that this is true. And of course, we have good reason to believe it, not, not because we want it to be true, or not because for many of us, perhaps, our moms and dads raised us to believe it was true. No, Jesus himself gave, gave unmistakable proof, a mark of authenticity that his words are true. He said that he would die and on the third day would rise again. And he did it. He rose from the dead and he proved that his word will, is true and will remain long beyond even the earth itself. This is his promise. And ask yourself then, what are those promises that God has given me to stand on even when this earth and the heavens pass away? What are the promises that God has given you that will remain? He promises forgiveness to those who call out to God in mercy, asking for his mercy. He promises love to those who believe they are unlovable. He promises healing to those who are broken by, by guilt and by shame and hope to those who, are, who have been jaded by this world. He, he promises life even in death. All, all of this he promises. And when we talk about faith, we're not talking about a privately held opinion or something that we hope is true but we're not really sure. We're, ta we're talking about something solid, more solid than the ground itself. We're talking about that which we place our confidence in, our trust in. Think of it this way. If, if a child climbs up the jungle gym and hears his dad tell him that he'll catch him at the bottom of the slide, well, that child lets go of the sides of the slide and zooms down, trusting his dad will keep his word. So we have our promises, the promises of Jesus, which we hold on to and trust, promises which we live by and promises which will sustain us through this life, promises which will help us stand on that last day, not by our own strength or standing on our own wisdom, but standing with the full weight of our confidence planted in what he has promised us. This is the promise. And in the meantime, well, Jesus, he gives us a prayer. The prayer. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus says our prayer should be this, that we would be able to stand before Jesus on that day when he returns. When you look at what Jesus taught about prayer, he said a lot about how we should pray, that we should be bold and, and persistent in our prayers. He said who we should pray for, that we should pray for our enemies. He said we should pray for children and for each other. But as far as I can tell, there are only a few places where Jesus says, this is what you should pray for. Of course, the Lord's Prayer is one of those places. And this is another one that we ought to pray that we will stand on that day when Jesus returns. And if that is the goal of our prayer, that when Jesus comes back, we would stand because our redemption is drawing near. If that is our goal, then, then really our prayer is that we, would be re, that we would be relieved of whatever would hinder us from standing on that day. If, if right now I gave the magic pastor hand signal, and did one of these and told you to stand, my guess is most of you would stand without much effort. But if an NFL offensive lineman put his arms on your shoulder and pressed down with all his weight, it would be another story. I doubt any of us would be able to stand if that were the case. And think of it that way. What is now weighing down on you that would prevent you from standing on that day? And it's not something that's a weight on your shoulders, a literal weight or a literal standing. No, Jesus says it's those things which weigh on our hearts 
that might prevent us from standing on, his, on that day. He said, watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Just ask yourself, why did Jesus cho- choose those three things on his short list? Dissipation, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And I realize that dissipation is not a word that we use all that often. The Greek word that it's a translation of here, it might be better understood as wild partying or something like that. It has to do with overindulgence, over drinking. And just to consider that, over drinking and drunkenness make Jesus' short list of things that would keep us from being ready. I know that we're quick to point out the fact that that drinking alcohol is not a sin, that Jesus changed water into wine, that there are no prohibitions about drinking alcohol in the Bible. But perhaps it would do us well to stop it and to consider that for some people, alcohol is a temptation and a hindrance, a stumbling block to them being ready for Jesus' return. And we should do more than just pause to participate in a culture here in Wisconsin where drunkenness is not just tolerated, but sometimes it is celebrated. And what leads to overindulgence? What leads to alcohol abuse? Really, it's the third thing on Jesus' list, isn't it? The cares of this world. The things that we are afraid of. The worries, the anxieties, the things that keep us up at night. And it's been said that that if you follow someone's fears, you can find their idols, the false gods that they are secretly worshiping. And just think about some of those false gods. We, we, We know them. Money, success, relationships, career, health, children. Well, there is a corresponding fear to each one of these false gods. And when that fear is governing and controlling our lives, then we are being weighed down in the way that Jesus is talking about. And what do people do when they are weighed down by life's anxieties and fears and worries? Well, they try to find an escape, something that will help numb the pain or distract them for the moment. And for some, yes, it may be drinking. For others, it might be some other addiction, some other distraction. And it's true. A drink or two might help you relax and might help you feel like the world isn't such a scary place. A pill or two might take the edge off, at least for the time. But it is a cure that is much worse than the disease because it not only does not get rid of the thing of which you are afraid, but it leaves you in a cycle that brings you down. And you can see then why Jesus says, on our list of things that would prepare us is prayer, a prayer that we would stand on that day, sober-minded and alert, ready for his return. Maybe add that to the things you daily pray for, that you would stand before Christ that day. And realize that the answer to your prayer might be in the people that are around you. That if if you struggle with anxiety or you struggle with an addiction that has you trapped, perhaps the first thing you should do is, is find someone that you can talk to. Someone who can point you to help. Someone who can pray for you. And if you're worried that they're going to look down on you and judge you, just stop and consider. If someone you cared about came to you and confided in you that they were struggling in a way, you wouldn't look down on them. No, you would commend them for their courage. And you would do all you could to help them and you would pray for them. We would be able to stand together on that day. That is our prayer, the prayer that Jesus leaves us with that we would stand ready when he comes back. You know, throughout this season of Advent, for the last couple years, we've been opening our services with hymn number 18, 
We sang it this morning. Oh Lord, how shall I meet you? And it begins with a question. It says, Oh Lord, how shall I meet you? How welcome you aright. But as far as I can tell, it never actually gets around to answering that question specifically. How should we meet Jesus? How should we welcome him when he returns? Isn't the answer this? Standing up. Standing up. I'm not talking about literally standing up if you're unable to stand, for example. But standing up in the sense that we are not afraid of the day when Jesus returns. Standing up because when we see these signs appearing, when we see Jesus coming on the clouds with all of his power and his glory, we know he comes to rescue us. We know he comes to bring redemption to us. And so we stand. Standing up because we know that while he comes with great glory and as judge, he already came to this world, came to bring salvation, born in Bethlehem to rescue us, to die for us. Standing up, not in fear, not with anxieties weighing us down, because in Christ, all of those are removed. And in him, we find our peace. So Jesus, today, in this season of Advent, tells us to be ready, and he gives us a prophecy, and he gives us a promise, and he gives us a prayer that we would be ready when he comes. Come, Lord Jesus, amen.